welcome to this video. In this video, I'm going to show you all the sights of Sunderland. Sunderland is on the northeast coast of England, a short drive from Newcastle upon Tyne, and I'm going to show you all of the sights in Sunderland from the coast, in the city, on the outskirts. I'm going to show you all of the sights of Sunderland. It is a long video. So if you didn't want to watch the full video, you can always have a look in the description below and I'll put the links to all the places for you in the description below. So I'm starting off the video with Seaburn. Now Seaburn is a beautiful coastal resort and I'm going after this I'm going to show you Roca, which is also um, just next door to Seaburn and uh, the locals here when they go to the coast they tend to say we're going to Burn and Kerr which is Seaburn and Roca <laughs> so um, so this is Seaburn um, so it's a huge huge beach lovely soft golden sands um, hardly any rocks or pebbles or anything beautiful coastline it's huge enough room for everyone um, you're not all crammed together like you are on some beaches there's lots of room and um, it's wide open space and uh, today I'm filming during the heat wave of July 22 and I thought it would be a nice way to get cool down at the beach and it is because you get a lovely sea breeze coming from the sea so here we are at Seaburn where people come to sunbathe, have fun and they often enjoy some fish and chips. Well, you wouldn't be going to the coast in, 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 the, in the UK if you didn't have some fish and chips. So this is where they come for the fish and chips. They go on the beach and they have time to relax. They go paddling, they go swimming. And um, so this is Seaburn. Now here you are, five minutes down the road at Roker. Now Roker has been renovated. They've got these beautiful wooden uh, like buildings that look like beach huts now. But these um, buildings are like shops and restaurants and things. And you've, their beach isn't as nice and soft as the Seaburn Beach. There's a lot of rocks and things here. It's more enclosed. But you have got Roker Pier. So this is Roker Pier. And um, on one side you've got part of the beach you can see Seaburn right off in the distance there so you've got part of the beach on this part of the pier and then you've got the more enclosed part of the beach on the other side of the pier so this is the north pier and it's, it's a long walk well not that long but it is fairly a long walk to the other end of the pier but it's a very pleasant walk and uh, along here you will find men who enjoy fishing so if you're the type who likes to come out and try your look at fishing, um, this could be a spot where you might want to come. It's a really pleasant spot. You'll meet lots of other fishermen here while you're there. There's lots of other fishermen who enjoy fishing here. So that dog's having a nice rest there with its owner while the owner sits and waits for his catch. visit the lighthouse there is a website you can go to rokapia.co.uk and you can book a tour of the lighthouse and there's also a tunnel that you can walk along and but um you can the cost is about eight pound for an adult and um but you can actually book group bookings as well but if you go on their website www.roka here.co.uk you can find out much more about it so this is the marina the roca marina which is just a few minutes away from roca beach you can have a wander around there looking at all the beautiful boats in the harbour and you can see at the moment it's a lovely calm day and uh not very many people around, but uh, it's. I think it's a really nice, pretty sight to look at. All of these beautiful boats, all in rows, at the marina. A little bit further down, we've got the National Glass Centre. Now, this has been here a few years now, and um, it is actually free to get in. There's a huge car park on the top, 
and um, it's also like it shows you they do glass blowing demonstrations there's a cafe there's a shop there's exhibitions when i got there well, there was a five minutes before closing time so they said to me, well, you can have a quick wander around, but, you know, we, we're not doing any demonstrations or anything at the moment. Um, so um, if you go, you know, allow yourself plenty of time to get there before it closes. And then you can have a good look around. You can have a look in the shops and you can have a look in the cafe. Maybe he's got a bite to eat and something to drink. And you can have a look at the um, demonstrations and go and have a look at them blowing glass. Now glass has been like one of the like the Pyrex, the Conan's factory. Um, you know, there's a lot of history to do with glass making in the northeast in Sunderland. And um you can have a look at all of the um products that they've got on display here. Some of the glass is really beautiful. And you might remember, you know, if you're as old as me, um, the type of glass like these Pyrex. I remember those cups, those Pyrex cups. And, um, you know, the casserole dishes, the Pyrex. I remember those little cups and saucers um, from a long time ago. And, uh, you know, it'll help bring back memories for you. So a little bit further on from the glass company... A little bit further down the road, in fact, we've got St. Peter's Church. So St. Peter's Church in Monkweemouth is one of the oldest churches in Britain. And it was built in 674 AD by Benedict Biscop, who is known to be the patron saint of Sunderland. And um, he was given the grant of the land by the Northumbrian king, Egfrith. And um, there is a stained glass window inside of the church dedicated to Benedict Biscop. So, walking through the church, it was originally a long, narrow church going from west towards the east altar and they did add extensions on during restorations so this church was built in the 7th century and at the back of the church where the west wall is that is the oldest part of the church So you can see there's a modern font here and it has St. Peter's cross on the font and it's also got the cross keys which is um, a symbol of the when Jesus said to St. Peter you've been given the keys to heaven. The Bible reference actually says in Matthew chapter 16 verse 19 and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. So this is the oldest part of the church, the 7th century West End. The West Wall here. The original church had small windows, not like the large windows you see today. Towards the east of the church, where the altar is, you can see a large stained glass window. Now that window depicts five saints 
Going from left to right, you've got St. Aidan, then the Venerable Bede, St. Peter, St. Paulinus and St. Cuthbert. The tomb is of Sir William Hilton, who was born in 1376 and died in 1435. Sir William Hilton is from the Hilton family, who owned Hilton Castle, which I will show you later. The pattern on the floor here is an image that is found on ancient stonework in the West Porch which dates back to the 7th century and it depicts some serpents that are intertwined and nobody knows the meaning of this image and it's only found in this building. There is a display in the church showing these serpent-like creatures and also some other designs that used to be on the porch which has now disappeared of animals and um, you can see clearly the drawing there of the design that is on the stone pillars in the porch area. And it looks like two reptile type creatures and intertwined. So here you can see the creatures in this very ancient 7th century porch on the west side of the church. They, are, they have been badly weathered over the years Those openings were in fact doorways into the church at the time. So you can only enter the porch from inside of the church. The tower was built on top of the porch later on. And it has a bell tower and the strings to the bells are in that porch as well and it, they are still in use. There is a stained glass window dedicated to the Benedict Biscop who founded St Peter's Church And Benedict Biscop is, in fact, the patron saint of Sunderland. There is a small model of what the monastery used to look like back in the 7th century.
The most important history of St. Peter's Church is the creation of the Codex Amiatinus. This is a Bible, a full Bible with the Old and New Testament and it was created by the monks, including the Venerable Bede, back in 700 AD. And this Bible was made from calf skins. This is a copy of the original Codex Amiatinus. I visited St. Peter's Church. There was a very informative guide there who explained a lot about the church to me and he also explained about the Codex Amiatinus. Let me just go through this from the Wikipedia page because it is quite complicated uh, but it's very important because St. Peter's Church dates back to the beginning of the Bible um, so let me just tell you about this. So the Codex Amiatinus is the earliest surviving complete manuscript of the Latin Vulgate version. So the Vulgate is a late 4th century Latin translation of the Bible that was to become the Catholic Church's official promulgated Latin version of the Bible during the 16th century and is still used in the Latin Church to this day. The text of the Vulgate is kept in numerous manuscripts. It was produced around 700 AD that is in the northeast of England at the Benedictine Monastery of Monk Weirmouth Jarrow. So So Monkweemouth and Jarrow, Monkweemouth was St. Peter's Church and Jarrow was St. Paul's Church, but they were the monasteries then and they worked together and um, so they, um, they were like a joint monastery type of thing. Benedict Biscop used to travel to Rome frequently and he used to bring lots of books back to the monastery. So the Venerable Bede became very knowledgeable, reading all of these beautiful, knowledgeable books that Benedict Biscop had brought back to the monastery. So, the Bible was created in St. Peter's Monastery in 700 AD. Now, they created three Bibles. So, three copies of the Bible were commissioned by Abbot Seelfried in 692. This date has been established as a double monastery of Monkweemouth Jarrow and they secured a grant of additional land to raise 2,000 head of cattle needed to produce the vellum. So, because it was written on cattle skin they needed to raise the cattle so they could use the skin for the Bibles. Bede was most likely involved in the compilation. In 716 Seelfried accompanied one copy, the Codex Amiatinus, intended as a gift to Pope Gregory II. But he died on his route to Rome in September 716 and then someone else managed to take the book to the Pope. The book later appears in the 9th century in Abbey of the Saviour of Mount Amiata in Tuscany. Hence the description Amiatinus because that's where it appeared again. At the time nobody realised it came from Sunderland. They thought it was actually written by the Pope at first and um, and then later on it wasn't until much much later um, in 1888 Giovanni Battista di Rossi established that the Codex was related to the Bibles mentioned by Bede. This also established that 
Amiatinus was related to the green leaf Bible fragment. So it's a fragment of the late 7th or 8th century Bible. It's almost certainly a portion of one of the three single volume Bibles ordered, made by Sealfrid, a bit of Monk Weimar's Jarrow. It is closely related to the Codex Amiatinus, which is the only um, Bible, full Bible to be still in existence. Because the other two Bibles um, had been destroyed, but this particular Bible was the only one that was still that had still survived after all these years. So this Bible um, is n is still kept in Florence. So the page. Uh, with the dedication to Seafrith uh, uh, of the English was altered into Peter of the Lombards on that particular page. And that's how they realised it was to do with the Sunderland St. Peter's. Outside the church, you can see the history is imprinted in a cobbled pathway. So in this particular stone, it tells you that bead was only seven when he entered the monastery and um, it depicts lots of various historical times during the um, time of the monastery it tells you like there that biscop falls victim to progressive paralysis in AD 686 and how some of them had died um, from the plague the cobbled path goes from St. Peter's Church in the direction of the river because the river was a lot closer to St. Peter's Church in those days and they did use the river for cargo and goods and things. On their website it tells you the times that you can go to visit. Um, so they're only open between 10.30 and 2.30 and that's when the guide's going to be there to show you around. Um, they're closed on a Saturday and it's not open for tours on a Sunday. Um, there's the address there. On their website, you can actually take a virtual tour of inside the church. So if you live, live a long way away, you can actually go on to the Google site and you can explore the church in 3D and have a look around for yourself without actually visiting the church, which, which is a very good feature that they've got. This is the University of Sunderland and it's not very far from all of the other places I've just showed you. It's on the north side of the River Weir, about five minutes from the glass centre. And um, so it is the Faculty of Technology, School of Computer Science, Faculty of Art and Creative Arts. And there's lots of other buildings as well in this area. So I'm just going to play some music just while I have a little wander around here. So here is the Sunder University of Sunderland on the south end of the River Weir, uh, not far from the city centre. And um, this used to be the Polytechnic, as I remember it, but it has changed a lot over the years. It didn't look like this 
when I lived in Sunderland. Um, it has had lots of renovations since then. And it looks more of an attractive place for people to study here. Um, they do attract students from all over the world. And so this is the Sunderland University on the south end of the River Weir, near the city centre. Just across the road from the university, up this path you've got the metro and like Newcastle, Sunderland has the Tiny Weir Metro, or it's called Nexus Metro these days. And um, so the metro service runs from Sunderland all the way to Newcastle and South Shields as well. And um, it has an extensive metro line here, which is handy for the students. They can just hop on and hop off the metro when they're coming to the university. So Newcastle has a Theatre Royal, Sunderland has a Sunderland Empire Theatre. Now I've been, I've visited this theatre many times through my youth, all the pantomimes and I've seen some bands and shows and the Osmonds got banned from here because it was after the the airport had collapsed, so wouldn't allow them here. Um, so there's been lots and lots of stars, including the Beatles here. And this week we've got Giovanni and Anton de Beck, who are here from Strictly Come Dancing. Him and me show. So they're doing a, a dance show here at the Sunderland Empire. So this church is what I remember it to be called is Bishop Weymouth Church but it has changed its name it was originally St Michael's Church and then it became Bishop Weymouth Church and now it's known as Sunderland Minster and um, this is just opposite the Sunderland Empire and these historic buildings here are the almshouses and they were funded by somebody called Jane Gibson who made these houses for the poor as an alternative to the workhouses. And they've just recently had a grant to restore them um, back to the former glory. Bridges multi-storey car park is probably where you need to park if you come into Sunderland City Centre. It's just near Bishop William Mouth Church, you can see there. And you can access the Bridges Shopping Centre through the car park or you can walk along towards the church and then turn right to the city centre. So the Bridges is an indoor shopping centre. Um, it hasn't been an indoor shopping centre forever. It used to be open and then they put the roof on. And uh, there is a large variety of shops here. Um, admittedly, it's not as big as Eldon Square or the Metro Centre, um, but it is a large shopping centre. Um, for things that you may need and uh, it's good that it's enclosed especially in the winter um, makes sense to have it enclosed so this is the Bridges Shopping Centre in the centre of the city centre Thank you. 
Here we are in Jackie White's Market inside the British Shopping Centre. Now, although the shops come and go and change quite regularly, Jackie White's Market has been in Sunderland for over 100 years. Now, Jackie White was a businessman. He was born in 1884. He started his business selling fruit and veg in his horse, with his horse and cart, and then he opened two shops, and then he opened the market. Um, I think it was bombed during the Sunderland Blitz. And then um, it was moved eventually into the Bridges Shopping Centre. And it's, it's been in the Bridges Shopping Centre for at least 40 years now, I would think. Um, so everyone in Sunderland knows Jackie White's Market. It feels like it's part of Sunderland's history because it's been here for so long. Whereas the shops change all the time, Jackie White's Market is still here. And um, people who live in Sunderland or who who know Sunderland w will know Jackie White's Market and, and will have been inside Jackie White's Market and bought things here. And it, it, it feels like it's a it's because it's so been here so long. It feels like it's like a stable part of Sunderland's history. Uh, if you want, you can pause the video to have a look at the plan of Jackie White's indoor market there. So it is a historical site really, um, it's worth a visit. They do sell very good produce here and goods that you may want to purchase when you're in Sunderland and it's worth having a look around. Don't forget about the other streets when you come to Sunderland if you come to do any shopping. This is High Street West at the bottom of the street there on the left is Marks and Spencers. Um, there are a lot of other like um big stores in the other streets around uh, the bridges so um, it's not only about the bridges when you come to Sunderland there are other streets with big stores as well around the bridges so this is Mowbray Park it is just five minutes walk from the bridges it is in the city centre and it is a relaxing place where you can go to have a wander have a walk Across the pond there you can see the Sunderland Museum and Winter Gardens which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so here there's a lot of wildlife, a lot of birds and ducks and things. It has been recently renovated. This memorial has been built in Mowbray Park and it's to commemorate the tragedy that happened in 1883 at the Victoria Hall which was an entertainment building just next to Mowbray Park and it is a real tragedy what happened there.
the Victoria Hall disaster, 1883. So the hall was opened in 1872. There was seating on the ground floor as well as in the dress circle on the first floor and the gallery above. And due to its size, the hall was a popular venue for public meetings and entertainments. However, the disaster on 16th of June 1883, some 2,000 children aged mostly between 7 and 11 crowded into the hall. They'd been given tickets um, by the travelling entertainers from fairs, um, the Tynemouth Aquarium, and it promised the greatest treat for the children ever given and offered every child the chance to win a prize such as a toy or a book. As the performance ended, it was announced that prizes would be given to the children with a certain numbered tickets. At the same time, prizes began to be handed out to the children on the ground floor. So the excited children, 1,100 of them, decided to leave the upstairs and come downstairs to claim their prize. But the door at the bottom had been wedged open with a gap of just 20 inches, um, which would only allow one child through at a time, and they were crushed. So um, a lot of them died. Um, a total of 183 children died in the tragedy. Some families lost all of their children. The entire Bible class of 30 children from the local Sunday school perished in the disaster. They all died of asphyxia. So in other words, they were all weren't able to breathe because of the crush. It's a very, it was a very sad time. However, um, this monument um, that has been erected in Marlborough Park is just recent. Uh, the Victoria Hall was actually bombed by the Germans in 1941. Despite the tragedy, the hall actually stood for another 58 years um, after that. Um, after the tragedy, they raised £5,000 for funds to give in to be given to the families for the funerals of the 183 children and Queen Victoria sent a message of condolence to the families and donated towards the funeral costs and after the after that and um, what came of that after the inquest um, they failed to blame anyone um, there was a public outcry and a second inquiry was held but that too um, failed to find out who it was that bolted the door as it was however as a direct result of the disaster parliament issued laws that required all places of public entertainment to have sufficient number of exits and that all exit doors must open outwards and to be easy to open so that was uh, what um, led to the fire exits that we see today um, with the push bar opening and um, was this tragedy in Sunderland that spurred the development of the push bar exits. You'll also find in the Mowbray Park all the war memorials of all the wars, um, these granite slabs with the dates and the information about the wars that we fought over the years and uh, the tragedy of all of the soldiers that have lost their lives during those wars. If you're into your fitness, the Sunderland Silksworth Sports Centre is worth a visit. Everyone active, Silksworth. And here you'll find um, a swimming pool, there's tennis courts, and there's a huge gym here as well. And there's also a ski slope, a skating park, a playground. So here's the tennis courts inside the Silksworth complex. And you can see here there's a, a large gym as well and a swimming pool.
Hilton Castle stands in North Hilton. It does go right back to um, the time of the Norman Conquest in 1066. It was a wooden building when it was first built and then it was built in stone. Uh, it, was, it has had um, the, mostly, uh, the, it was occupied by the, the Hilton family. and um, But nowadays it's owned by the English Heritage. So it's a very grand castle, you can see there. And um, it was built in stone in the 14th century. So a lot of the castle will date back to that time. You can see on the West Facade there, there's a lot of coats of arms. So you can have a closer look there. So if you go on Wikipedia, it does explain which a court, which coats of arms are on the castle. There's, there's about 20 on this side of the building, including from the famous knight, Henry Hotspur, who was a famous knight. And um, it is quite interesting that they can date the castle from the coat of arms that are on there and it tells you a lot of history about the castle. Next to the castle is a small staircase that leads to the ruins of a chapel. This chapel was dedicated to St. Catherine and it's known to have existed on the site since 1157. It was originally a wooden building but then they built it in stone around the 15th century. And you can see there as well as coats of arms on this building too. So here is the home of the Sunderland Football Club. This is the Stadium of Light and the Black Cat House. Now the Sunderland football team get called the Black Cats. That's their nickname. And um, they are currently, they've just been promoted into the Championship League. And... Um, they have won some top titles. They've uh, they've won the FA Cup twice in 1937 and 1973. They were also runners up in 1913 and 1992. Now, 1973, when they won the FA Cup, um, I was only a kid at the time, and uh, 
our family went down to the town centre to watch the homecoming and I can always remember the sea of red and white hats everywhere, red and white scarves, people were standing on roofs. It was absolutely crowded and it was a great atmosphere and um, it was just such a, a joy to be there in 1973. And, uh, you know, the James Blunt song, 1973, um, I like to think he's talking about when Sunderland won the FA Cup. <laughs> I mean, it might not be about that, but I like to think it is about that. Um, so here we are at the Stadium of Light. Um, it is a huge stadium. It has a capacity of 49,000 people. Whereas Roker Park used to have a capacity of 42,000 um, there is a kind of rivalry between Sunderland and Newcastle. It, I, I think it's because they're so close together. You know, Sunderland and Newcastle are only a 20 minute drive between them. And, um, and so there's always been some kind of rivalry between the two teams. Um, people from Newcastle are called Geordies. And do you know something? I didn't even know that they were calling people Mackhams until I went to Newcastle and they, t and they said, because I was born in Sunderland, um, they said to me, you're a Mackham. And I was in my 20s at the time. And I says, what's a Mackham? And they says, well, you're from Sunderland, so you're a Mackham. I didn't know we were called Mackhams. So um, I, I don't think it's something that the, the Sunderland people like to be called. I think it's a kind of racism kind of mar remark because they're talking about the dialect, really, because in Sunderland, um, you know, it's a very much like the Scottish accent. It used to be. It has changed a lot over the years. People, uh, it's you, you very rarely hear that Sunderland dialect anymore. Um, not as much as what you used to hear it, but... Um, they they say they call us Mackhams because um, the way people used to say it, make them and take them. So it's they, they might have said Mackham instead of make them. So like if we're talking about building ships, for example, uh, the Mack them, Mackham, Mack, Mackham instead of make them. So really it is kind of... Um, it's a kind of racism term against the dialect of what, how Sunderland people spoke at the time. And um, I, don't, I don't know if I'm speaking on behalf of all the Sunderland people here, but uh, I don't think it's a, a name that Sunderland people like. And uh, I think really they should stop calling people from Sunderland Mackhams. I think it's quite insulting, to be honest. Um, Geordies, I mean, nobody, everyone's proud to be a Geordie. I don't think people from Sunderland would be proud to be a Mackham. <laughs> so, um, you know, we could stop that language. You know, you can just say we're from Sunderland. You don't have to call us Mackhams. Um, but I don't live in Sunderland anymore. I left Sunderland when, when I was in my 20s. But I, I can still remember the 1973 homecoming of the uh, Sunderland team. Uh, my family, like my dad and my brother's, all supported Sunderland and um, and I have spent a lot of my time north of the river um, so I support both both Sunderland and Newcastle um, I lived I've lived north of the river half my life and I've lived south of the river uh, north of the river Tyne half my life and south of the river Weir half my life so um i support both teams um but there is some rivalry there between the two teams um so really really we, we've got so much in common you know we should all just get along and be happy for each other's teams in my opinion but you can actually visit the Stadium of Light um, like you can with St James's Park. I have done a Newcastle video. I'll put the link below for that. Um, and, uh, you know, I think both teams, I'm, I'm proud that there's, they've got two really good football teams in the northeast of England. Three, counting in Middlesbrough, of course. Next to the Stadium of Light is the Sunderland Aquatic Centre. So this was built in 2008 
and it contains an Olympic size swimming pool, a diving pool and a gymnasium. And it is the only centre with an Olympic size swimming pool in North East England. We're going to leave the Stadium of Light now and the Sunderland Aquatic Centre and we're going to go for a drive and we're going to go and have a look at Sunderland Bridges. So the Sunderland Bridges, I don't mean the Bridges Shopping Centre, the bridges that go over the River Weir. So you can see in the distance there, the Weirmouth Bridge. So this was opened in 1796 and it's made of cast iron and it spans about 73 metres over the River Weir. And uh, before that, they just used to have to get a ferry across the river. So it helped to um, expand Sunderland with this new bridge. So we're now approaching the Queen Alexandra Bridge. So this was built by Sir William Arrell between 1907 and 1909. And it was officially opened by the Earl of Durham on behalf of Queen Alexandra on the 10th of June, 1909. It used to have a railway on the upper deck that used to transport coal. And around 6 million tonnes of coal passed over the upper deck every year for export. Um, but um, the trade started to decline around the end of the 1910s and the last goods train ran over in 1921. And the upper deck was also used in the Second World War as a searchlight and anti-aircraft platform. Using a different road, we're going to pass under the Queen Alexandra Bridge so you can get a better look at the two different decks, the lower deck and the upper deck, the upper deck carried railway lines for the trains carrying the coal. We're now approaching the Northern Spire Bridge you can see in the distance there. It has a very modern design and it's because it is modern. It was only built in 2018. And um, it was constructed to reduce congestion in the traffic and uh, it has worked. It is very useful to get to Gateshead and Newcastle using this bridge and to Washington. And you can see it's not congested, you know, there's um, plenty of room for the traffic. It is a very attractive design and um, I think it's a nice, a real nice pleasure driving across this bridge. It was designed by Spence Associates in partnership with the structural engineering firm Technica. It was first designed in 2005 but it was kept confidential until they got the funding for it. The cost of the um, Spence design was estimated at £133 million. This is part of Sunderland College. It's the Bede Campus on Durham Road in Sunderland. And it used to be Bede School, which was a grammar school. And I think it was in 1973 that the grammar school became a secondary modern school. So when it was a grammar school, you needed to pass your 11 plus to come here. 
and um, and the, and in 1973 they changed it so you didn't need to pass 11 plus. In fact, the 11 plus was abolished across the country around that time. So it is a further education and higher education college, and um, they normally have around 6,000 part-time learners and around 5,000 full-time students. Statistically, Sunderland College has held the top position of colleges in sixth forms in Sunderland, achieving the best grades locally in comparisons to other top schools. This is Fulwell Mill in Sunderland and it has been restored to its former glory. It was actually built in 1806 and then it went into disrepair and then it was fully restored to a working mill again. You can't actually visit the mill, um, that door in that building on the right there the, you can speak to someone in there and they could organise for a guide to show you around and it is free of charge. A volunteer guide will show you around inside the mill. There are five floors to this mill and it is very complicated engineering that they used to do at the time and the guide will explain to you about what each room was used for and what all of the engineering did in regards to making the green and um, so you will get a tour of all five floors it'll take you up these um, sometimes very steep uh, wooden staircases but at least you're only going up one floor at a time and uh, when you come back down, you need to come back down the stairs um, backwards so that there's a, a less chance that you could fall. And um, it is quite interesting learning about all the different parts of the machinery that they used to use in those days in the flour mill. And um, But just to warn you, you have got these like quite steep wooden staircases to go up and then you've got to go down them all at the end obviously so um you know as long as you can actually walk up the stairs uh you should be okay um but if you do have any kind of disability or anything there's nothing wrong with just asking the guy to show you around on the ground floor and just explain a bit more about it to you At the end of the tour, the guide will ask you if you want to make a donation. And um, where you make that is in the building where you first went to ask about it. You know, the building outside. And um, it's up to you if you want to donate anything. But if you do, just remember to take some um, some cash with you. There are a few mills on the outskirts of Sunderland. Uh, this is at Whitburn, this mill. And um, But like I said before, the only working mill is the one at Fulwell. I'm not sure if you can actually go inside these ones. You do get a lovely view from here of the sea. It is very close to the sea. There are some very attractive looking houses in Whitburn and uh, with really some interesting designs. I was I passed these houses on my way to the mill and uh, I just wanted to show you. Um, they do look like mansions in fact. Uh, Whitburn is um, quite a popular area um, because it is so close to the sea and it's on the outskirts of Sunderland 
um, in the green belt, so to speak. And uh, so they have got some very pretty houses there. Here we are at Pencher Monument. Now, Pencher Monument is in Pencher, which is in Sunderland. And um, it is quite a steep hill to walk up. And uh, you may get breathless halfway up. If you do get breathless and you find it pretty tough to walk up the hill, then just have a rest before you continue the rest of your journey. Um, so here we are at Pension Monument. So um, this is a Grade 1 listed building and it uh, stands 136 metres above sea level. You can see it from miles around, you can see it from Tynemouth, you can see it from Wall's End. You can see it from many miles around because of the height of the hill. And it was designed um, on a temple in Athens called Hephaestus. I think that's how you pronounce it. And it was designed by Newcastle architects John and Benjamin Green. And it was built by Thomas Pratt of Sunderland. So um, it overlooks Harrington Country Park, which we will go to next. And the Wetlands Trust on the north side, which we'll talk about later. So the word pencher comes from the old British word pen, which means hill, and shore, which means a wooded area. So a pen shore means a hill in a wooded area. And uh, the foundation stone was laid in August in 1844 by Thomas Earl of Zetland and um, um, it's made of grit stone from the quarries of the Marquess of Londonderry. Steel pins and brackets hold the blocks together um, but over the years they have deteriorated a bit and um, when I first came here I didn't realise there was a stairway on the other side <laughs> and uh, it was a bit of a hike trying to climb up this little stone wall here and uh, so this visit I noticed there was a little staircase to walk up which was handy. I don't know how long this little staircase has been here but uh, um, I bet a lot of people didn't know it was there and just tried to climb up the wall like I did the first time I came. So when you get to the top, you can see there's some remarkable views. And you do feel like you're standing inside a Greek temple. Because the columns are so big. And because you're up such a height as well. So you can see 360 degrees all the way around. It's a nice place to sit and just watch the world go by like some people do when they come here. So there's Harrington Park in the distance there. You can see the lake. We will be going there next. You can see the farmers ploughing the fields in the distance there and you can see how huge this is with an open skyline. That door there used to be a staircase that they used to let people go up 
but there was a tragedy. Somebody fell 70 feet to their death. So since then, they don't let anyone in there now. So let us go now and have a look at Harrington Park in the distance there. So here we are at Harrington Park at that lake I was showing you from Pensher Monument and you can see there's a lot of wildlife here and um, that sign it says for model boats only so I don't think the ducks can read. <laughs> um, so we have got this uh, huge lake here where people come and sail their little model boats. And there's also a huge area around it where you can walk or cycle. I was lucky enough when I was there to see some men sailing their model boats on the lake. And uh, one gentleman was telling me that he modelled his boat on the Atlantic Challenger, the, the first Atlantic Challenger that Richard Branson tried to cross the Atlantic with but sank. And then Richard Branson's second boat, uh, the Atlantic Challenger 2, actually broke all world records in the Atlantic. And there's a model of the first Atlantic Challenger. So it is a large park, you can walk along the paths uh, or you could cycle along and um, so there is a lot more to explore in Harrington Park but uh, I haven't got time to show you all of it today. So we're now in Barnes Park which is very close to the Sunderland College on Durham Road and um, so this park I think is a more natural looking park and it's um it has the playground for the children it's got a, a big lake as well and um, there's lots of areas to explore This is my favourite park in Sunderland and um, I like it because you feel as if you are out there in the countryside. They have a large variety of different trees and um, and they are, some of these trees are really beautiful and uh, they're not like the trees you would normally see in like if you were out and about and, um, and I think you know they have really taken care of this park and it's always been really, really nice to walk around it as far as I can remember. And um, so this park is a real joy to walk around, especially in the summer. And it's a great place to bring your children as well. Barnes Park opened in 1909, that was over 100 years ago and you can see in the distance there the bandstand. So this bandstand was a wooden bandstand and uh, it has stood there since 1909 but in 2009 they have actually restored it and they used the original blueprints to recreate it. I do have fond memories of coming here when I was a child. This is this was the park that we used to come to most often because it was uh, it was a popular park at the time um, and it still is a popular park. Um, it is a beautiful park and uh, if you're in Sunderland it really is worth a visit coming to Barnes Park. So I'm going to show you another special church. So I've already shown you St. Peter's Church, which is a very ancient church built in the 7th century in 
674 AD. This church is St Andrew's Church and it was built in around 1907. And they have styled it on the olden architecture. Sir John Priestman, a wealthy shipyard owner, funded for this church to be built. And you can see an inscription there dedicated to him. So this church was built in around 1907. And uh, he gave specific instructions so you could see the tower from the sea and also for there to be 700 people to seat inside the church and also he wanted everyone to be able to see the altar and you can see there the inscription that was made to his wife and um, so let's have a look now at inside of the church It does look like an inverted hull of a ship and that might have been on purpose because Sir John Priestman was a, the owner of a shipyard. So as you walk through you can get a closer look at the ceiling. So this magnificent ceiling was painted in 1927. Quite unusual for a church in the UK to have a ceiling like this. And it's a dedication to the creation. Behind the altar, they have this fabulous tapestry, which was created by the William Morris Company and Edward Burns Jones. And this is a, one of the copies they made. The original is now kept in the Victorian Albert Museum in London. Um, I think there was three copies made and this is one of them. And um, what this is, is the story of the three kings visiting Mary after she gave birth to baby Jesus. The carpets you can see are also from William Morris. Other places to visit on the Sunderland um, coastline, or very close to the Sunderland co coastline, is the Souter Lighthouse. So at the Souter Lighthouse you can actually visit this lighthouse as well. And then you've got Marsden Rock which is forever changing so take note of how it looks like today because in a few days time it could look completely different um, because parts of the rock are collapsing all the time with the tides to get to the beach you need to go down these steep stairs and this leads to the beach um, to get back up you can actually walk a bit further along the beach and there are some easier stairs to come back up if you need to. You can see far off in the distance there. So you can see Tynemouth Pier there and you can see Tynemouth Castle in the distance there. There is another way down, but only if you are going to the restaurant. So the restaurant is in the, the entrance is in the car park and it's called the Grotto. It's been here since 1782. They specialise in seafood and there's a lift, but it's for customers only. So if you are going to be a customer of the Grotto, then you can use the lift. 
Years ago, they used to charge you for using the lift. And um, I think there was a machine there, if I remember rightly. Maybe it's that machine broke or something, and that's why they decided that you could only go using the lift if you were a customer. I'm not entirely sure. So the grotto was actually built inside of a cave. And let us just have a look at their website. So we have a look at the history here. So the history tells the tale of somebody in 1782 called Jack Bates, also known as Jack the Blaster, and his wife Jessie used dynamite from a local quarry to blast a large cave into the side of this coastal cliff at Marsden Bay in South Shields, creating themselves a rent-free home on the beach. Before long, Jack became involved with smuggling activities, allowing smugglers to hide contraband cargo from abroad in the coastal caves. The grotto exchanged hands many times and was gradually developed into an inn with several rooms through the 19th century. Its notorious and often criminal history forms the basis of several popular legends and ghost stories, including that of Jack the Gibber, a smuggler who was reputedly murdered by his fellow criminals after selling information to Her Majesty's Customs. It is said that he was hung in a barrel in a cave close to the present lift shaft and left to starve. So that's information about the history of the place. And you can have a look, they, they do have a modern day um, video on here, but before we look at the modern day video, let us look at their archived video. Come back to the days when men were men and women had to make the best of it. Back to the times when home wasn't a semi in suburbia but a cave in a rugged hillside. So come to Marsden near Newcastle where the wild rocks are a testament to the past. Heading for a restaurant built into the craggy cliffs. This is how I remember the inside The Marsden the cliffs are honeycombed with caves and the grotto makes an eerie eating place for it echoes with legends. Jack the Jibber, a smuggler who betrayed his comrades to the excise men, was tortured here as a reprisal. They say you can still hear him moaning. It has changed a lot over the years and um, they have got this little video on their website. It has changed a lot over the years. Nothing like I can remember it, to be fair. Um, so it looks like it is well worth a visit. The restaurant, the hotel, they look very smart and elegant. So pay a visit. And the grok itself changes all the time. Not sure how long it's going to last out there. Half of it has disappeared already. Thank you for staying with me. We're almost at the end of the video now. Um, I want to show you around inside of the Sunderland Museum and Winter Gardens. Um, when I came first time, it was closed. Um, 
but I did go back. I'll show you that video in a second. Uh, you can see the opening times there. Pause the video if you want to know what time they're open. Um, just a little bit about the building itself. So it was built originally in the Athenaeum building on Fawcett Street. And then it was moved in 1879 to this building here. So it's stood here since 1879. And during World War II with the Sunderland Blitz, um, the Winter Garden was damaged by a parachute mine in 1941. And it was demolished the following year. And they, they did get a lot refund in 2001 and they were able to renovate the Winter Gardens. So you can see the olden day building here at the front. And uh, this is how I remember it when I used to come here when I was younger. And so we had the museum door, the library door and then the art gallery up above on the top floor there. According to Wikipedia, in 2003 the museum was recognised as the most attended outside London. So this is the Winter Gardens. It's got this enormous fountain here. That goes right up to the ceiling. You've got the walkways above. And you've got dinosaurs scattered around. To try to show the tropical climate that the dinosaurs used to live in. So all of these plants are tropical plants and because they're in this huge sort of like greenhouse they're able to thrive here. do have a large art gallery here and they often also have exhibitions here as well. They do have some artwork by L.S. Lowry and he had visited the North East a few times and he'd stayed at the, the Seaburn Hotel which is now known as the Grand Hotel. So you can see some works by L.S. Lowry here at the Sunderland Museum. On the top floor, you can see models of the ships that were built at the Sunderland shipyards. The shipyards date back, in fact, to 1346. And they've had, they had, at one time, over 400 shipyards on the River Weir at Sunderland. They did, in fact, in 1854, build over a third of the country's ships at the time. And Sunderland um, are very proud of their shipbuilding history. The last shipyard closed in 1988. Because Sunderland was so popular with building ships and because they were so useful to the government for building warships and the likes, Sunderland was bombed a lot in 19. 40s by the Germans during the World War Two. Here's a picture of the museum and the Winter Gardens after the bombing in 
1941. You can see all the glass is smashed there. So the Germans did um, attack Sunderland a lot of times between 1941, no, between 1940 and 1943. And uh, according to Wikipedia, an estimated 90% of the city's buildings were damaged and 1,000 buildings were destroyed. And um, there were around 300 deaths and around 900 people, around 838 people injured as a result of the Sunderland Blitz. And uh, on one day, particular day, on the 24th of May 1943, 152 people were killed and 512 were injured. So that was during the bombing of in World War Two. The bombing of Sunderland by the Germans. King George visited uh, Sunderland after the Sunderland Blitz um, to show respect um, and look at and survey the damage that had been done by the the Germans. And they even bombed this hospital on Durham Road next to Bede College. This was a children's hospital. So there was a lot of damage done during those years. So have a look around the Sunderland Museum. Um, you know, they do have like setups of like dating back to certain times, like this one dating back to 1969, where you can have a look at how they used to live in those days. And there's somebody from that time um, talking about it. And, you know, most people had one of those record players in those days. Um, and it also will show you the type of food they used to eat and things like that. So it's worth having a look around. They do have a cafe here where you can buy snacks and meals. And uh, they do have like an outside patio where you can eat outdoors if you want to. I haven't got time to show you the whole museum. It is a very big museum. Um, allow plenty of time to have a wander around it. It is a free entry. And uh, this is the gift shop that you'll see going in or when you're coming out. And um, so you can have a browse in the gift shop as well. So this is the Sunderland Museum and Winter Gardens. I think I've covered most areas where you can visit when you come to Sunderland. There are a couple of areas where I've already made videos for, such as the Washington Wetlands, which is a really, really delightful place to go and see all the wildlife, all the birds, the flamingos. It is an amazing place to visit, which is in Washington on the outskirts of Sunderland. And also the Washington Old Hall which dates back to George Washington's family, you know, the president of the United States. And that's worth a visit too. And I've made a video for that. I will put the links down below for those two videos that you can watch if you want to at a later date. And I've also made a long video about Newcastle upon Tyne. And I've gone into detail about the, all the areas you can visit when you come to Newcastle. So I will put a link down below for the Newcastle video as well. It has been a very long video. Um, if you did manage to watch all the way through, thank you very much. Um, it is a long video, but I wanted to get across the real history of Sunderland. And I wanted to show you, you know, how much worth it is to visit Sunderland because a lot of people might brush Sunderland off. Um, so I wanted you to see Sunderland for what it really is. And I wanted to tell, tell you a bit more about the history. So I hope it's been helpful to you and I hope it's in, in, it has inspired you to visit Sunderland. Thank you for watching the video. 
um, if you have enjoyed it please give me the thumbs up and please subscribe to this channel if you want to see more videos like this and thanks again for watching until the next video bye for now